Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to this uh, wonderful panel on overcoming the great global 19 uh, depression. Uh, it's, it, it sounds a little bit like a very heavy... developed countries, rich countries, and rich people uh, are conducting those discussions or at least people with opportunities and possibilities. So it's super important that we also talk about uh, bridging the divide with poor countries, helping them flourish, and also helping poor people and the marginalized people of this world, both in developed and in developing countries, because we're basically all developing countries, let's put it that way. So, um, without further ado, because um, we have this, the stars of today are the, um, the five speakers that I have with me. You can all see who they are by clicking their uh, faces and then you see uh, what they do, who they are and where they work. Uh, so, I'm not going to spend time on that because we would lose time for the discussion. And so... Um, Michiel Set, um, the executive director of UNITAR, would you like to kick off this panel and to give us some insights setting the stage for the discussion? The floor is yours. Happy to do that, Simone, and you're absolutely right. It's the debate, if you look back on 2020, the debate around the COVID pandemic has been really hijacked by the richer countries and the, uh, you know, at the expense of the concerns of developing countries. And if you think back, what has this debate really focused on in 2020? First, on the health dimension, obviously, on the prevention, treatment and cure of this terrible disease, on issues of mental health. This is under the health cluster. Then uh, more recently, the economic dimension of the fiscal stimulus, uh, Biden's 1.9 trillion uh, fiscal stimulus package, uh, the EU is looking at almost uh, 0.9 trillion uh, as a stimulus. Then we've been looking at the social and the human rights dimensions, especially the impact on women and girls, which is disproportionate. And rightly so. We've been looking at the environmental dimensions, what's happening to waste, what's happening to chemical waste, to other things, what's happening to the climate. Is it really a friend of climate, this COVID disease? Then we've been looking, unfortunately, at the political dimension. And there we've seen only bad politics, frankly, where we've seen, uh, especially in 2020, the choices that have been made in many of the issues around COVID-19 on lockdowns, on sequencing, on vaccines, etc. Very, very badly handled in most parts of the world, I would say. And uh, uh, so and we've seen competition amongst nations finger pointing, a uh, time when we needed to get together uh, as a global community. We've seen all kinds of nationalistic, jingoistic, uh, absence of coordination, absence of any sense of human solidarity. And that's very uh, sad to look back on 2020 and see what uh, ha has happened, what has caught the world's imagination. <laughs> Um, I think uh, Nikhil has left us temporarily um, just as he was going to enter the discussion on what has happened in the developing world. Um, let's hope he will be able to get back to us in a minute. Um, but would it be an idea, um, Cynthia, if you already say a few words, if Nikhil comes back, he continues his conversation. Um, but not to have uh, to, to wait for for him to come back. Please, please go ahead. Thanks, Simon. I, I think what he was saying was very interesting about um, where we are because of the lack of human solidarity. And I would say, thankfully, Costa Rica is where we are thanks to the human solidarity we had in the past. Since the '40s, we created what is called the Caja del Seguro Social, which is a universal healthcare system that. I think 
made a huge difference. That solidarity view we had in the past to where we're today and how even though, and I know we're going to talk about that in the future, but um, Costa Rica depends on tourism and we were really hit hard, but you mm -hmm. can see that we're one of the first countries that received the vaccine and that our uh, most vulnerable population is getting the vaccine everywhere. So I think that um, we need to address that the vulnerability or the gaps have increased for some, but also the wealth for others in this whole situation. And that if we see just the increased wealth of 10 billionaires is more than enough to pay vaccines for everybody around the world. And that's from the last uh, Oxfam report. And the vulnerabilities have been hitting harder, these gaps, different types of populations, especially when they're more diverse. So, for example, just in, in the um, Black and Black Americans, Hispanic or Latino populations, they have three to three point eight times greater um, rates of mortality than white people. This means that we could have saved twenty two thousand Latinos and Black people; they would still be alive if they had the same mortality rate than white people. And also one in every six black women have lost their jobs between February and April. So it's different. And I think we need to have this inter intersectional approach. One of the big critics we have been receiving is, for example, all the feminist movements have been very white. And that means we've been taking into account data that tries to, to say that all women are, are living the same reality And no, it's different if you belong to a certain ethnicity, if you are an immigrant, if you have a certain sexual orientation, et cetera. And I think these, the taking this to account is important to understand reality. And we also see a, a lot of that is happening with the indigenous communities that normally are not talking about. And they're having poor access to sanitation, clean water, They're living discrimination, have very high mortality rates. Indigenous women are are in a, a very severe situation of domestic violence also. And something else is the impact difference between rural and urban communities, where we see that the rural communities are having a higher impact on poverty rates, for food insecurity, and then... Summing up something that I know that Christopher is going to talk about more on the impact on women. We see that, for example, in Latin America, a lot of women are entrepreneurs on selling services of uh, food services, hospitality, uh, tourism, etc. that were the type of industries that were hit higher. Plus, they're the ones that are suffering more unemployment. Ironically, they're the ones that have more college degrees in our countries, but are the ones that are suffering more unemployment. So this is not a thing about um, having being knowledgeable about this. And um, last one, and I'll give back the, the, the floor, um, is the educational gap, where we've seen that people without a college degree have four more chances of losing their job than ones that don't have. And the thing is that edu education with COVID has become un inaccessible to many communities with a digital or technological gap. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Nikhil, you're, you're back, fortunately. And Cynthia um, already went into some of the consequences of COVID for marginalized um, um, groups, but also for certain specific groups in society which were affected disproportionately because, for example, their data were not included in the system and some of the movements vying, and that's basically what you were talk talking about as well, vying for change were white people's movements. So um, maybe you can continue because you, I think, just were on the verge of starting to talk with us about what happened in the developing world. So please go ahead. If you fall back, mm. um, I'm please. sorry. I'm sorry for the technical uh, gap. But here, you know, 120 to 150 million people went back into abject poverty in the developing world. And this is the World Bank. Hunger is on the rise. 
And this is the first time after many, many years we've seen this return of hunger. And uh, what do developing countries desperately need now is spending on health. And uh, their tax revenues are falling. Their export earnings are falling. Their debt distress has become greater than ever before. And uh, collectively, uh, just to quote you the statistic that the 120 developing countries owe $3.1 trillion of external debt. And servicing this is a big liability for them. To top it all, the contraction in remittances is taking place for migrant workers. 14% the World Bank is uh, estimating there'll be a fall in remittances and the sluggish uh, foreign direct investment into developing countries. Precarious working conditions in developing countries and for migrant workers and commodity dependence and tourism dependence for many small countries. Imagine the plight of all the small island developing states. They generate 40 to 50 percent of their total GDP from tourism revenues. That's all gone. So you are having, on the one hand, you know, contraction in revenue. The trade contraction would be uh, to developing countries is over 800 billion uh, so far over the last year. So the picture is rather dismal and uh, the SDGs, uh, aspirational though they are, they seem to be getting further and further behind. You know, crisis management has taken over the world. Nobody's thinking long term. It's always our political leadership is so short sighted that the SDGs at least help them put their mind to something which is 10 years down, 15 years down the road. But with this crisis, no one is thinking long term. They're just thinking survival. And this is the problem. So what do we do? First, I think developing countries need more policy and fiscal space. Uh, they've been getting support uh, in the past from the developed world. And those contractions in overseas development assistance and various kinds of concessional finance should continue. Second, the debt, there should be a standstill for the, uh, to cope with this crisis and a fundamental restructuring of the nature of their debt to the developed world. Uh, they need to spend more on vaccines and health expenditure and develop, uh, countries have to help them uh, you know, with these vaccines. They need to be encouraged on social safety net spending uh, where they develop deeper schemes for protection of livelihoods because employment is one thing, but livelihoods is a much more serious problem and uh, we need to encourage them and help them uh, to protect livelihoods. We have to look at ways of reviving trade and tourism. We have to shockproof supply chains. We can't have the situation for the next crisis, the way supply chains collapsed completely. And we need supply chain resilience. And of course, we need stability for the problems of migrants. Uh, they still pay 7 to 10 percent uh, as bank and other transaction cost fees. We promised them in the SDGs that it will never be more than 3 percent, but we are way far from getting to that 3 percent. So I'm just giving you a snapshot of what are the sort of things we need to do. There's no one magic formula. Simone, you'd also asked us to give us our one thought. I would say solidarity, coordination and cooperation, uh, because we need multiple ways of tackling this deep crisis, which has accentuated even deeper crisis the world had before COVID-19 struck. So coordinate, cooperate, and show a spirit of solidarity. That's what we want at this point of time. So thanks, Simon. Okay, thanks so much. Maybe uh, that's for, for later, but I would love to uh, to ask you later on, Nikhil, um, you have spoken about some really serious stuff that needs to happen to get back on track for the SDGs, if ever. effective, inclusive, results-oriented leadership. Where is it? Who is going to lead this change? So that's for later on in the discussion. I give you time to think about this. 
Um, because I think that's a quite crucial thing that most of the time is not being discussed. So the measures are discussed, the activities that need to happen, but the leadership that's going to lead this change is, is, is not being discussed. So thanks so much for now. You gave us a lot of uh, issues to think about. And Cynthia, um, I'll get back to you. So you can finish your uh, intervention and then afterwards, Christoph, it's all yours. Thank you, Simon. Um, well, I was sharing some stats, but I think that the um, main issue here is that we have very privileged um, leaders that are take making decisions in countries unaware of this the impact their decisions are having in different realities when we have a more intersectional approach. So I think that being aware of the different impacts. And I'm just going to uh, give an example. I've been working with over 50 rural communities in Costa Rica. One of these communities is um, with women fishers and public policies that in order to advance on conservation, and I totally agree with that, have decided that certain types of fishing is no longer allowed and have left a lot of women in very rural communities with no jobs. So I think that we need to understand the more, more local realities also and the impacts they're having when leading. And that would be one of the uh, quick answers to the question you had. Um, we need to be closer to reality and design strategies for that. I need to unmute myself as well. Otherwise, uh, I'll be talking to no one there. Well, thanks so much. Crystal, please go ahead. Here you go. Thank you, Simone. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I mean, the way we see it is, um, I mean, I'm, I'm the CEO of World Vision Switzerland, so our focus is obviously children around the world and, and how this has an impact on children. And I think we talk very little about children, actually. We talk all the time about economies and about health issues, but um, children are impacted quite massively um, at the moment, um, and we see great things happening. We see also really sad, um, sad events and sad statistics. And I just wanted to divide my points into three parts. Um, it's basically the economical, the social, and the educational um, uh, um, parts that are or challenges that, that we see right now. Um, and I really describe children as being the invisible victims um, of this global of this global crisis, who will, to some extent, have to carry the burden of this uh, for long for long years to come. And just to give you some um, of the statistics, some of them are actually coming from the UN. Uh, many are coming from us as well. We are working in more than one hundred countries around um, the world. We're one of the largest children's NGOs, so. We've done a number of reports over the last year. That, for example, we've estimated that in the last year, um, more than um, 85 million boys and girls will have been um, exposed to physical, sexual, or emotional violence. An additional 8 million children have been pushed into, ch into child labor and into begging. And I think this statistics is quite easily also illustrated by the fact that if you look at the global workforce of single women-led households, you will see that 90% of those women um, work in the informal sector, which means they were the first ones who lost their jobs and indirectly obviously has um, had an impact, not just on themselves, but on their, um, on their families. From um, one of the issues that we're working a lot uh, with is the problem of or the challenge of child marriage. Um, we've estimated that last year alone, four million additional child marriages took place very often caused due to the increased poverty of parents who, to a sad part, have no other choice than almost selling their own um, children. And we see, want to see this trend, unfortunately, continue um, in the years to come. And 
we see that an additional 66 million um, children will fall um, into extreme um, poverty, in addition to the more than 200 million who live already in extreme poverty. And then comes the educational crisis, which is all around the school closures, um, and indirectly from that also an increase of 65% of child pregnancies um, over the last year, children being at home, being exposed to potential dangers, but being also exposed to other you know, sexual activities that could lead to um, unwanted pregnancies. And I just want to share a little story that I just came across um, this morning. One of our programs, for example, in Mongolia, um, I, saw, um, I, um, I saw a little boy and he had just received a tablet. We have to imagine he comes from a family, what we would call as an extreme poor family, where the family doesn't even have the money to pay the license to run a TV. So most of the education in Mongolia at the moment is happening via TV. Um, but thanks to local sponsors, we were able to distribute um, tablets. So it was amazing to see um, how small things that maybe are kind of obvious to us, our parents would just rush out, get the next tablet, and get us online um, made such a difference. But then also just to um, give you a sense that in the world, 20% uh, percent of the world's population probably has no or extremely limited access um, to internet, which of course makes many of those um, things increasingly um, challenging. Um, just one brief part that I wanted to talk about is innovations and what we have seen in terms of the hopeful parts. Yeah, so of course these are very dramatic figures. And as we said before, these dramatic figures need a great sense of solidarity and really working together on the issues. And I, I talk a lot about beyond borders and particularly on the leadership front. But what we have, for example, um, seen, and that was beautiful how that unfolded is, um, as a Christian organization, we work together with faith leaders around the world and not just there. Yes. <laughs> It, it appears that you're there, but we don't see or hear you. So that's a little issue there. Um, you don't... Simone, I can see everyone and hear everyone. So maybe yeah. it's a problem at your end. Yes, it's on your side. It seems like on your side, yeah. Yep, I think you lost Simone. Are you still here? I'm still here. Let me see. Let me see what's happening now. Um, Do you hear us? Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Now I'm back. I'm, I'm seeing you here. Yay! <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah. I'm almost at the end of my... Of my um, yeah. We have another, like, uh, 20 minutes more or less, so... Yeah. That would be good. Yeah, thanks. Great. Two more points. And I just wanted to show on solidarity what we've seen now. For example, over the crisis, we managed to educate and mobilize 400,000 what we call community health workers around the world. And many of them are volunteers. So there's a great sense, even in the poorest communities, um, to help each other. Um, and um, we were also, I mean, we we're part of the global response, which is called the COVAX response, where we bring the vaccine to the poorest, um, to the poorest corners um, in the world. And obviously very excited to see that it, was able, that it was possible to develop a vaccine in less than one year when the other vaccines in the past took an entire decade um, uh, to develop. So thanks from my side. So I'm handing over. Well, I think to, um to Adelina, so Adelina and, and Hugo, can I um, ask you to take about three minutes so that we have another 15 minutes left uh, for us to, uh, to talk a little bit about the issues that, uh, that we still need to discuss. 
further that the connection is not stable all the time. Please go ahead, Adelina. Okay, well, um, I come from Malaysia, one of those developing countries that uh, Nikkei has just spoken about. Uh, we try to call ourselves a high income nation, but we are very far from that. Um, we come from a manufacturing base, and there is you know, a fair amount of um, issues, I suppose, when you talk about labor, uh, you know, uh, foreign labor as well. We talk about the informal workers, the gig economy. Uh, and I think we do recognize that sometimes it's not really about um, having a high income nation to help a developing nation. Because on the ground, we need to help ourselves. So it's really about having the people and communities in smaller pockets, helping each other. So a point in question, I would just say, uh, even a small community that I'm in where I live, we have come together, you know, uh, in the residence association, we have come together to help the people in our community who have lost jobs, the youth who couldn't get a job and are having to do some gig economy work. We've come to procure together as a group to procure their services or their goods, or if they are creating something, they're cooking at home and they're selling cooked food, stuff like that. We are coming together to do that. At the same time, we're helping the agriculture, which is very, very deeply affected in Malaysia. Um, because the supply chain for food has been broken during lockdowns. Uh, we, we are helping as communities, small communities. We are helping to procure, you know, directly from the farmers who have not been able to deliver to, you know, wholesalers and all that, that they used to. And a lot of the food has gone to waste. So we touch on food security. We touch on supply chain. Uh, we do this in a way where... You know, it's important to bring people together to unite where you are and help yourself, right? Now, I agree with Nicole in a sense that on a broader scale, uh, developing nations uh, do require some restructuring of their debts because debts have gone over the top right now. And it's very heavy. Uh, all countries probably are still borrowing very heavily, whether you're a developed or developing country or emerging markets for that matter. And that restructuring is essential. Uh, one of the things which I think is really important, which probably uh, we are also um, around the world, we are also distracted with vaccines and the rollout of vaccines and the, the impact of what the vaccines is doing as well, you know, to the human body. Um, but what we really need to have more focus on where governments are concerned is really, I feel, more on reviving the economy, really having more trade, having more discussions and collaborations and, you know, focus on that. Because when businesses are moving, then there will be more tax to be, you know, paid to governments for tax revenue that will go into helping the marginalized um, communities, whether it's the social worker, the self-employed people, whether it's the disadvantaged, whether it's, you know, um, people, you know, ab aborigines and, and all of that, that really, really require the help. So that is my uh, perspective. Okay. Um, and that's the, the perspective that I take, you know, for solutions to come through. Um, and uh, I, I take your point also on leadership, uh, Simon. And I believe that a lot of a lot more social dialogue is required, you know, internationally as well as locally, domestically. Um, and a lot more focus on, on moving forward rather than the continuing debate about vaccines and their rollouts. Oh. 
Okay, it's super interesting. It's so so far, I hear everybody talking about solidarity, cooperation, collaboration, coordination, and also bringing top down and bottom up movements together, and have them work together in a constructive manner. So I'm I'm really looking forward to Hugo. You're the last one for your presentation. If you can. We have to understand how it is today. It is a mess. It is a complete mess worldwide. We have about half of the airplane fleet on the ground, uh, which uh, reduces, of course, uh, on the supply chain, the cargo capacity enormously. A lot of uh, carriers uh, on the ocean have been taken out, problem of international crews, and, and, and etc., which finally leaded also in a complete imbalance of trade, always on different uh, moments. And uh, so we are missing containers all over the world. Where we have containers, we have no freight. Where we have freight, we have no containers. And the prices uh, at the moment are doubling, tripling. Uh, I mean, uh, Asia to Europe, we have an eight time higher shipping price today. Uh, over the last two weeks, uh, shipping to the United States from Europe over doubled. Wow. Uh, it's enormous and we get no space. We get no space and tiny things uh, which are happening today. Uh, I mean, it's not tiny for Texas, but if Texas gets snow, uh, the chemical industry goes down in Texas, which overloads the worldwide system again. Uh, some base chemicals, uh, clients of ours are using just double the price in the last 10 days. So, uh, how is this going to be afterwards? I mean, price and capacity will always dictate the supply chain and we are reactive, not proactive. I mean, we are doing what, uh, uh, we are executing such. So price and capacity will dictate this. Uh, we are today in a market where mostly stuff is made to order instead to stock. And the made to order, which then also comes just in time, uh, is geared in worldwide. So on a worldwide basis, even if we want, we can't change. Uh, it's very paradox and, uh, uh, we have seen that with examples, uh, you know, I mean, uh, to produce a mask in China uh, is about seven times less the price than in Europe. So uh, it also would make no sense in the future to change such things uh, back to production. However, to, to, to see that uh, we have emergency stocks for the future, etc., uh, considering the negative interests uh, in Europe, uh, may uh, most part of uh, uh, Euro, US, and Swiss currency at the moment, where we have negative interests, uh, it is possible that may be a switch from May to order. Uh, not categorically, but at least in certain commodities where it's possible. We'll go to stock orders again because the the the, the big driver for May to order was uh, uh, cash flow, uh, reducing stock, not binding capital, etc. Binding capital at the moment costs money, so maybe there is a shift back. However, we believe by end of the year, depending on vaccinations and how this is going forward, also with the mutations. But if things are going as planned now, we should probably be regularly in the shipping business by end of the year again. And uh, further down there, the supply chain, in my opinion, is going back into the old situation as it has been. Capacity is here. It has to be deployed. It will be complicated to, to clean up the mess we are in right now. Uh, but I see it going back to normal as it was within the next uh, six to 12 months. 
But you go. You told you told uh, me before that um, rich countries now are investing big time in maintaining their dominance. Um, I, I just to to yes. get to the issues, and then the corporates will just go back to maximizing their profits. So if we look at the other side, and so that, that is basically a little bit of a bleak reality. If we look at what I heard from Nikhil, from Cynthia, from Christoph. Um, so what about the SDGs? How can we ever get to sustainable, inclusive societies, uh, leaving no one behind, where everybody gets opportunities and where everybody has access to high quality and affordable services? So how do you, maybe all of you can quickly go into this on how can we get people, communities behind this? How can we increase the pressures to make a real difference on this issue? Nikhil, would you would like to, to start with this? Yes. <clears throat> I'll, I'll link my response to your earlier question on governance because clearly it's an issue of leadership and no leadership, no SDGs, no nothing. And, uh, uh, and you know, I was thinking that leadership and good leadership is not linked to political systems. Uh, communism can throw up good and bad leadership. Autocr autocracies can throw up good and bad leadership. Uh, liberal democracies can throw up good and bad leadership. Uh, and so on. So clearly it's not linked to uh, political systems. So let's keep political systems out of the equation. And let's look at uh, the countries that did worst uh, last year in terms of deaths and infections and everything related to COVID. They were all led by mag macho males. And, uh, you know, chest thumping macho males, if I can describe them. And they were the biggest disasters for their countries and their people. I don't want to name them, but we all know who we're talking about in 2020. Yeah, I think we can imagine some names. Yeah. Yeah. And where were we successful? These were all women leaders, uh, particularly in countries like New Zealand and uh, Finland. And we've seen these examples. Of course, in my own, I've been working now 40 years. And it's quite clear to me that women are better leaders. They have a big, better team spirit. They know how to cooperate better. They have much stronger feelings of solidarity and compassion. So we probably need to look at new leadership now, which focuses much more on women leadership because nothing else seems to be common, at least in the way the crisis was handled. So how do we get back to the SDGs? I would say first we have to revamp our political systems to throw up leaders who feel that compassion for their have to co-opt everybody in society to lead this charge, whether it's the media, whether it's education systems, whether it's the scientific or technological community. So it's a big uh, hill to climb, but we have to climb it and we have to co-opt everyone who's willing to push us up this hill. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, that, uh, that's a clear statement, I would say. Um, who would like to go? Maybe, Hugo, you would like to say a few more words on, on what I challenge you on. No, I just uh, uh, follow up on you, what you said uh, with women leader. I mean, if you're familiar with the Swiss system, we have seven uh, uh, people in the... Uh, uh, what we call Bundesrat, which is our federal government, and the three women definitely are better than the four men. Okay. Christoph, <laughs> uh, Cynthia? Cynthia, ladies first. Oh, you don't dare to Okay. Um, I, I agree with um, what you all said. I definitely think we need to move towards inclusive leadership. When we have seen the results of studies of behavioral sciences, we've seen that you can um, try to train somebody, but you won't change their behavior and you won't change their unconscious bias until they 
have contact without group members. And I think that the problem is that our governments or our leaderships are uh, leading only for certain groups. Um, governments or institutions, but we don't have inclusion. And inclusion is how much decisions are they being able to, t to make in the table and to rule for others. And I think this has to do with bringing reality to where decisions are made, having that, that diversity including, included and giving them the power to make decisions. Okay. Thanks so much. Christoph, Adelina, some last wisdom that you can provide us with. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more on the on the leadership side, and I just wanted to add uh, two more points there. I think where some of the leadership crisis is today is I think the way how we view leadership in general, um, and I think how we sort of see that that strong captain on on the forefront of the boat, and I think that's not anymore a reality, um, and that means it has to be more inclusive, and I think. Well, many leaders today have to realize we are in a time where we learn to un where we need to learn to unlearn. So there's a lot of traits from the past that we should just simply drop. And one of them is that we maybe the old thinking that women shouldn't be in leadership positions. That's probably one of those things. And I can only underline that um, having worked with incredibly powerful women. Um, and and I think what leaders need to earn. Um, able be able to achieve is a change of mindset and not just for themselves but it's you know you take people on on a on a bus basically and you need to change the way the direction is going and that is really hard it needs a lot of stamina um the way we lead actually um today and that at stamina not just the stamina but it needs it needs that vision and for that i think the qualities that should come with it is a certain humbleness but really a serving mindset, you know? I mean, again, coming back to your macho type of leader, I couldn't agree more. I think we're here to serve something bigger than ourselves, and that's why we should actually sit on the back seat um, and try to drive that change. So Adelina, over to you, thank you. Yes, Adelina, one minute, and then I'll have to, I have one minute more to close this session. I mean, we need two hours more, but anyway, Adelina, please. <laughs> Well, on your point of leadership, I think um, we are all leaders. So we need to lead and we need to be the ones that take action to an area that we see, no matter how small it is or how little that we see it is in the action, but we just need to take that, right? And make that difference, even if it's in one person's life, or many people's lives. So leadership really, in a broader scale of things, is sometimes saying, I'm willing to say and acknowledge that I don't know. I don't know what the solution can be, but I'm open to taking that risk of trying something that may solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So... I think that's what maybe if you want to see and say that there may be a gap in whether it's governments or corporate leadership or anything like that that's going on right now. Sometimes we are not listening and we need to be closer to the ground with the people, whether it's our consumers, whether it's our citizens, whether it's our stakeholders. Okay, so unfortunate, really unfortunate that we don't have more time because there are so many rich perspectives that you all brought to the table here. So let me say a few words to close this off. I think what we have heard is that to get back to the SDGs, to get them back on track in one way or another, we need more inclusive leadership. We need different types of leadership. I'm thinking, I don't know whether you know the book, The Leaderless Revolution, but as long as we have the leadership in the world we have, we need a leaderless revolution. And as Adelina said, we're all leaders. So I think we have to, to keep that in mind. We need to work together, all of us, uh, 
bottom up, top down, and get anybody on board, whether it's faith leaders, uh, absolutely, uh, Christoph, whether it's the corporate sector, whether it's NGOs, whether it's individual citizens who can make a huge difference sometimes. Think of somebody like Malala, or it's, they, you know, as, as citizens, we all co responsible. We cannot take it, uh, take it for granted that anybody will help us there. We need solidarity, cooperation, and coordination with one another to build that enabling environment for a sustainable change and, and inclusive and sustainable socioeconomic development so that everybody can flourish and nobody is being left behind. Thank you so 